If you enjoy this program, even just a little bit, come on over and join us at the World of Warbirds Patreon. There's plenty of free stuff there, including images to accompany the episode so you can see what I'm talking about. If you want to commit to the relationship, there are advantages to becoming a patron of the podcast. For just the cost of a single coffee per month, you'll be getting episodes earlier, you'll be getting bonus episodes, and you'll have the satisfaction of helping contribute to the podcast. If you're presently listening to this through Patreon, well then thank you for your support. Now on to today's show. Hello, and welcome to World of Warbirds. I'm Brian Pierce. Hello, Warbirders. In this podcast, I talk a lot about problems. It might be design problems, or an overall philosophy or strategy problem, or maybe it's an engineering problem, or something to do with materials or production, or the problem of the enemy dropping bombs on your workers' heads, which, you know, slows things down. Not here. The main problem with getting the Heinkel HE-219 off the ground was people. And mainly not the enemy. Or what's the expression? With friends like this, who needs enemies? This episode is going to feel a little different, as it will be less about switching engines and swapping weapons and all that. This one is going to be a more human story of rivals and squabbles and disagreements and petty feuds and grudges. Sounds a little like high school. But I still want to do the 219 justice. I've been wanting to do this plane for a while, and I'm not the only one. It has been suggested by both Kirk Fietland and our own Tanner. It was one of the first scale models that I did after getting back into that hobby. And as a model, I think it might be my favorite right now. But please don't tell the others. There's just something visually appealing about it, whether it's the distinctive blunt nose, the interesting radar antennae, or the clear and logical placement of the cannon, or the beautiful custom camouflage pattern that on my model I am particularly proud of. Just looking at it, it seems to be born to fly and hunt at night, very much like its namesake bird. So let's dive in and take a close look at the HE-219 Uhu. The concept of the HE-219 actually started way back in 1938, when aircraft designer Robert Lusser left Messerschmitt and returned to Heinkel. Yes, I said returned. Lusser was an interesting guy with an interesting story who started out working for Heinkel, switched to Messerschmitt, and then back to Heinkel. He worked on the HE-280 turbojet-powered aircraft, and later on he would work for Fiesler, ending up on a little project known as the V-1 Flying Bomb. After the war, he worked in America with the U.S. Navy. He came up with a formula to assess the reliability of systems known as Lusser's Law, and in using it, was correct in forecasting problems with the F-104 Starfighter, but incorrect in stating that von Braun would never build a rocket reliable enough to reach the moon. Later in life, he took a radical turn, literally, when he fell while skiing and ripped his Achilles tendon. He said, someone should design a better ski binding, which he did, and did very well for himself in running the Lusser Binding Company until his death in 1969. But, going back to 1938 to 1939, after returning to Heinkel's company, he was working on a high-speed bomber project that was known in the company as P-1055. Now that you know a little bit about Lusser, you can imagine that he was a pretty forward-thinking guy, and he sure was. This bomber was going to have power in spades using the dual crankcase DB610 power system, which was in reality two conjoined engines. Each power system would crank out a potential 2,910 horsepower. So in a twin engine aircraft using the DB610, this would be like putting four engines in a light medium bomber airframe, but with the drag of just a twin. 
Speed would be in the 470 miles per hour area with a 2,500 mile range with a 4,010 pound bob load. These numbers, if realized, would take it beyond de Havilland Mosquito territory. Not only that, this new bomber would have a pressurized cockpit, tricycle landing gear, twin ejection seats, and remotely controlled side-mounted defensive gun turrets. Sounds amazing! The RLM, or the Reich Air Ministry, must have wanted them by the thousands. No, they rejected it. And look, you can kind of understand it. The war was going pretty well at the time, and this P-1055 thing sounded like a very complex, risky, expensive pain in the butt. So Lusser, who was clearly a go-getter, came back with multiple versions of the aircraft, with various configurations of wings and engines and weapons. He even offered them an offshoot aircraft, the P-1056, which was to be a purpose-built night fighter with four 20mm cannon in both the wings and fuselage. You know, kind of like the concept that would become the American P-61 Black Widow. Surely the RLM must have accepted one of these offerings. No, it rejected them all in 1941. Henkel fired Lusser who went on to do the other stuff that I mentioned before. But when looking for someone to blame for all these rejections, perhaps old Ernst should have looked in the mirror. I go over Dr. Heinkel's story pretty extensively in the HE 111 episode, and he was not known for playing well with others, and he was a kind of complicated guy. At this point, I can offer the theory that he was loyal only to aviation. He skirted the Versailles Treaty and worked with the Japanese. He looked into moving his operations to America. He later partnered with the Nazis, but clearly didn't buy into all their theories because he objected when they made him fire his Jewish employees, even though he was a member of the Nazi party. But his objections made him suspect to some within Hitler's government. And even though he was granted the German National Prize for Arts and Sciences in 1938, which was the Nazi equivalent to the Nobel Prize, he was again royally ticked off when his company was seized and nationalized in 1942. On the other hand, he didn't seem to object too much to using slave labor. For all of these reasons, I really stand by my assertion that Heinkel cared primarily about building airplanes and less about loyalty to the regime. And that had made him enemies in the RLM. But by late 1941, things had changed. The night bombing campaign by the Royal Air Force had become so serious that the improvised night fighting Junkers Ju-88 and Messerschmitt Bf-110 needed help. If only someone had had foresight to design a purpose-built, high-powered, cannon-equipped night fighter. So Heinkel grabbed the plans for the P-1056 off the shelf, blew off the dust, and renamed it the P-1060. He shrank the airframe somewhat and exchanged the troublesome DB-610 engines with the smaller but still very powerful DB-603 inverted V-12 engines. And that was good, because the rejected DB-610 power systems were the ones that would end up setting fire to many of the aircraft that they were installed in especially the HE-177 Greif. Now it seemed that Heinkel had a slam dunk of a proposal, so much so that he started building and funding privately the first prototype himself while he sent the design into the RLM in January 1942 for what was certainly to be just a rubber stamp acceptance to get this superior night fighter that Germany desperately needed into the air. Nope rejected again in favor of new JU-88 and ME-210 base designs. What was going on? Basically, the head of the Luftwaffe's night fighter force, Josef Kamhuber, wanted the new fighter, and Erhard Milch, who was in charge of the aircraft construction in the RLM, didn't. And so there was this tug-of-war going on, and Heinkel was in the middle. But he kept on plugging on with the prototype, and finally, on the 6th of November, 1942, it flew. Kamhuber wanted it immediately, 
went around Milch and ordered it into production. Milch was upset, but you're probably thinking that, you know, he put his personal feelings aside and realized that Cam Huber, as head of Night Fighters, probably knew what he needed and accepted the cheeky, courageous decision. Nah, he had Cam Huber fired. But even so, a competition against the JU-88 Night Fighter was held in early 1943, and after seeing the results, the Luftwaffe quickly ordered 300 of what was now to be known as the HE-219. Its nickname was Uhu, Eagle Owl. And yes, I know that the Luftwaffe also had the FW-189, which was also nicknamed the Uhu. For either aircraft, I just like the way that the word sounds like the call of an owl. Uhu. So production was started late, and was delayed even more when the RAF raids on Heinkel's factories destroyed almost all of the blueprints in spring 1943. Oh, if only there had been a superior night fighter up there to help protect German cities and industries. But eventually, the first pre-production models were rushed to the 1st Squadron 1st Night Fighter Group at Venlo in the Netherlands. In its very first operational debut on the night of June 11 to 12, 1943, one Uhu shot down five British four-engine bombers four Halifax and one Lancaster in a mission of about an hour. Supposedly, when Milch heard news of this, he said, yeah, 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 he could have done it in any aircraft. Man, how petty can a guy be? The Uhu was installed with Liechtenstein intercept radar, which had a range of about four to six kilometers or three to four miles with a coverage of a 70 degree arc facing forward. Ground controllers would vector the Uhu into an intercept with the British bombers, where the onboard radar operator would take over, leading his pilot in close enough to shoot visually. Initially, the aircraft had some stability problems, but these were eventually worked out, partly by Heinkel offering a cash prize for the engineer who could solve the issue. Later production versions had longer engine nacelles in which were installed extra fuel tanks. In addition to the two 20mm cannon under the fuselage and two 20mm cannon in the wing roots, both with 300 rounds per gun, the Uhu had two 30mm Schraga Musik cannon aimed 65 degrees from the horizon with 100 rounds per gun for a lethal punch into the wing roots of a British bomber on the way in or in the belly of a British bomber on the way out. You didn't always want to shoot into the belly of a British bomber on the way in, you know, with all those tons of bombs in there. The HE-219A6 version was planned to not be a bomber killer, but a mosquito hunter. It was to be a lightened version, giving sufficient speed to hunt down the elusive mozzie. But the Uhu was continuing to shoot down bombers, including on the night of November 2-3, 1944, when one HE-219 killed six bombers in just 12 minutes. But even so, it was just too little and too late, and the night fighter force was suffering from attrition from battle and just operational accidents. HE-219 service manuals even included sections on how to salvage crashed airplanes, and reportedly six Uhus were actually assembled in the field from spare parts, and these were used operationally and had no tail numbers as they never came from a factory. But all of these efforts were not enough for the HE-219s and her night-fighting sisters to save the cities of Germany. Although one does have to wonder what might have happened if the work on the aircraft had been allowed to start earlier, and could have matured into a, you know, Luftwaffe Mosquito or... P-61 in sufficient numbers to make a significant difference? Well, we'll never know. The pilot we're going to look at today is Ernst Wilhelm Podro. He must have thought he was going to have a rewarding, but maybe a bit humdrum life as a working commercial pilot when he started his flight training in 1929. He flew passengers and mail on the Deutsche Lufthansa German-South American route for years, 
When war broke out, Modro started off his military flying in a fairly pedestrian fashion, piloting Dornier DO-26 flying boats on maritime or aerial reconnaissance and supply missions into Narvik during the Norwegian campaign. He was almost killed on the 28th of May 1940 when his DO-26 was attacked by the Royal Air Force Hawker Hurricane fighters while still on the water. The aircraft was destroyed and Modro was severely wounded. He must have thought he was out of the war. But after almost a year in recovery, he started as an instructor in a blind flying school. Then he returned to a transport role, flying over 100 missions on the big Blomenvoss BV-222 Viking flying boat in the Mediterranean theater. So far, we've not seen any evidence that within this mild-mannered transport pilot and instrument instructor was an aggressive killer. But then again, they always say that you have to watch out for the quiet ones. On October 1943, Modro switched roles and was trained as night fighter pilot and was posted to first group of Nacht Jagdschwader 1, which just happened to be evaluating our star aircraft, the HE-219 Uhu. On the night of 7 to 8th March 1944, he claimed his first aerial victory, none other than a de Havilland Mosquito. That was a pretty good start. A couple of weeks later, he knocked down two Halifaxes on the same night. Modro flew both the ME-210 and HE-219. He was part of the assessment team of the 219 and rated the Uhu to be superior to the 110 in speed, handling, all-weather operations, and even in landing. Once he got going, Modro became a prodigious nighttime bomber hunter often knocking down multiple RAF four-engine bombers per night in his 219. His best night was on the 21st to 22nd of June 1944, when he claimed four Lancasters. In the end, he shot down 34 aircraft, including two Mosquitoes, five Halifaxes, and 25 Lancasters. He was awarded the Knight's Cross of the Iron Cross, and seems to have seamlessly transitioned to serving in the West German Air Force after the war until 1964. He passed away on the 10th of September, 1990. One of my favorite Allied operational names is Operation Lusty, which stands for Luftwaffe Secret Technology. The LU comes from Luftwaffe, the ST from Secret Technology, and the Y from the Y at the end of technology. I don't know if they came up with the operation lame for this, but it always makes me think that these Allied guys were lusting after this fancy schmancy Luftwaffe technology. On the 16th of June 1945, this team took three captured HE-219s and flew them to Cherbourg, France, where they were loaded aboard the Royal Navy ship HMS Reaper. Along with 21 other captured German aircraft, the HE-219s were delivered to and then flown from Ford Field, Newark, New Jersey to Freeman Field, Indiana for testing. Werks number 290060 was one of them. After testing, it was crated and stored here and there, and after extensive restoration, it is currently on display at the Udvar Hazy Center. I would love to go there to see her in person one day. So, what happened to all the personalities we have spoken of today? I've already described what designer Lusser did, from working with the U.S. Navy to the space program, and then eventually becoming a ski-binding king. What about Dr. Heinkel? After the defeat of Germany, Heinkel was again barred from building airplanes, and so to pay the bills... Heinkel pivoted his company to build something a little less prestigious, but perhaps more useful in post-war Germany, scooters and mopeds. Also, like the post-war Messerschmitt company, Heinkel built these small automobiles that are critically cute, the Heinkel version being called the cabin bubble car. Eventually, the ban on building aircraft was lifted, and Heinkel again started making flying machines this time the F-104 Starfighter under license for the West German Luftwaffe. At that time, 
They stopped making bubble cars and mopeds, but they kept making scooters right up until 1965. Ernst Heinkel died in 1958 in Stuttgart and was inducted into the International Air and Space Hall of Fame at the San Diego Air and Space Museum in 1981. His company went through a series of mergers that eventually ended up becoming part of Airbus. Erhard Milch was picked up by the British No. 6 Commandos on 4th of May 1945. Supposedly, he was haughty and rude and waving his field marshal's baton around when meeting the commander of the commandos, Brigadier Derek Mills Robert. Supposedly, Mills Robert, who was known to have a temper and had just seen the horrors of the liberation of Bergen-Belsen concentration camp, was not going to have any of it. Supposedly, he grabbed the baton and broke it over Milch's head and then did the same with a nearby wine bottle. Milch was sentenced to life imprisonment for war crimes, mainly for mistreating POWs and the use of slave labor. His sentence was later commuted to 15 years imprisonment in 1951, and he was placed on parole in 1954, and he died in 1972. Josef Kamhuber, the former head of the Night Fighter Force, who had been sacked by Milch, did very well indeed. He survived the war, and after wrote reports and publications for the U.S. Air Force. He later joined the reformed West German Luftwaffe and became a general in that service. He died on January 25th, 1986. Thanks again to all who support the podcast through Patreon. I appreciate it so much. You can also check out some photos of what we've been talking about on the Patreon page. Until next time.